uh, the way that we, we both use and lose nitrogen in our, our farming systems right now. So, um, I, and I also think it's an extremely important topic because I think it really provides a point of convergence for talking about not just the negative externalities of agriculture, but the positive externalities. And I think uh, it's my hope that in this dialogue, that whenever we, we present all of the problems that we also are coming forward with, the fact that agriculture is inevitable, if we, we can't remove it, we need to find systems that generate positive externalities, of which there are, I believe there are many. And we, we, um, I think we will be able to hear more about this within this session. Um, I can. <laughs> so, uh, obviously fundamental to the, the high input system of American agriculture is, is um, to both crop and animal production is nitrogen, but with tremendous downstream costs, which I think we will hear from several of our presenters. And I, just from my personal experience of working with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, I think there's this tremendous ripple effect that I'm sure many of you are aware of, but it's really a question whether this high productivity really fueled by the engine of, of nitrogen is beneficial for global food security at all. In fact, I think it's a, an incredibly destructive engine for food security in, in many parts of the world where the surpluses of the U.S. really sort of eliminate markets in, in developing countries. So um, in, in our panel of presenters, we'll hear in this session, we have the opportunity to benefit from hearing from several different levels, from both national level and state level, and then to be able to hear something about alternative systems of managing nitrogen. And then we'll, have, we'll also hear from our respondents, um, which will give us a reality check on the cost, cost downstream and the challenges sort of over, over time of being able to address those, those costs. Um, the hope is that through this session, in our, if we can have a fruitful discussion in the half hour after the presentations, is that we could come to sort of a broad understanding of the, um, of the monetized costs not down to the level of details of costs, but sort of an understanding of what the scope of those costs would be, and then a common conceptualization of the possible benefits of, of identifying alternative management systems. Um, so I will introduce our first speaker, which is Jane Compton. She joined the Environmental Protection Agency in 1999 and studies the sources and effects of nutrients at different scales from microbes to national level. Thank you. Okay, so I am kind of a nitrogen nerd, so I'm glad to see some other people that like nitrogen or are interested in nitrogen here. I'm a biogeochemist, I'm a scientist with the Environmental Protection Agency, and so that means I have a lot of slides, and I'm going to talk really fast to get through all my slides. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about the, uh, the cost of nitrogen use in the U.S., and I, this is work that I've been doing with um, a number of postdocs that have been working with me, primarily Dan Savota, who's been cataloging the nitrogen inputs to the landscape. And um, as part of my work at EPA, we've been looking at the impacts of nitrogen on ecosystem services. And those are all the things that people benefit from, all the things that we benefit from, from the environment. And so we'll be talking about a number of these ecosystem services and the damages associated with reactive nitrogen. So as you probably know, there's been a huge increase in nitrogen inputs. Uh, Jonathan Foley talked about the effects on biogeochemistry today. Um, the uh, fertilizer production is the largest uh, source of this increase over the last 100 years. We also have an increase in fossil fuel combustion, which creates particles of ammonia and primarily NOx that go out of the atmosphere. And then we also have legumes, which we're going to hear one of the leading U.S. researchers on. Legumes later today talk about, so I'm going to skip over that, but like legume crops. So these are things like so corn, I'm sorry, soybeans and alfalfa and other um, legumes that, that humans plant to increase the, 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 for agricultural purposes. So drilling into that temporal pattern, we have the spatial pattern of where are the largest nitrogen inputs, and you can kind of see there's a fair amount of overlap with agricultural areas, so hot spots in the Midwest, and then I look in the West because I live in Oregon, you know, in central Washington, the Snake River Plain, and then the Sacramento San Joaquin Valleys in California. So there's large nitrogen inputs to these, these areas, um, and this is at the Huck, uh, Huck 8 scale, and this is a Huck 12 scale. So. 
The dominant sources of nitrogen across the landscape, the yellow and the green are agricultural inputs, and so this is for a given watershed, watershed unit, what the dominant source is. And so the gray areas are where atmospheric deposition is the dominant source. The green and yellow, yellow is where fertilizer is the dominant source. You can see a lot of places where fertilizer is a dominant source. And then agricultural biological land fixers, a lot of it is, is uh, pasture lands um, where, where people have uh, clover and things for pasture. So that's where that shows up. And then the little, um, at this scale, we see a little bit of confined animal feedlot application of that manure across the landscape. So that's those kind of reddish areas that, that shows up at this scale for as being the dominant source in some, some places. So what happens to this nitrogen? Um, a lot of the, so of all the nitrogen we fix, some of it we fix intentionally for use in food and, and, uh, and, and products. Some of it we, is naturally fixed and some of it we, we don't really need to produce. So it's a byproduct of, of fossil fuel combustion. About 63% of that is lost to the environment initially as it's applied to the landscape or as it's um, created. Um, and then even of the nitrogen that makes its way into products, which is on the left-hand side of the diagram, um, the food, most of the food still ends up going back into, into the environment. Some, by some pathway, it goes into animal feed, which eventually makes its way um, into the waste, the waste stream. So this is, this is an important thing to keep in mind, these, ex, these external losses of nitrogen. So this is the nitrogen cascade, um, initially conceived by Jim Galloway. Many costs of nitrogen. I also like to think of these are the places where we can put on valves and regulate the nitrogen release to the environment. So each of these little arrows, we could put a valve on those arrows, and those would be policy management, individual choices that we can make to affect the nitrogen cycle. But you can see where it comes from, where it goes, the impacts on the atmosphere, the impacts on surface waters, the impact on, on uh, groundwater and the coast in, in this one uh, nice uh, diagram. And so we use this to look at the cost. So in our cost, we take all that information that I showed you on the nitrogen inputs to the landscape, and we combine it with data that we've gathered on the costs of nitrogen. And we use a dollar per kilogram cost, kilogram of nitrogen released in the atmosphere. This is the same approach that's been used by the EU nitrogen assessment. Um, Hans von Grinsman published a paper a couple years ago in Environmental Science and Technology. And also there's been a, before that, there was a really nice study of Chesapeake Bay where they looked at the damages associated with nitrogen release in Chesapeake Bay. And um, that's uh, folks at Purdue and Tufts that did that work. So this is kind of a difficult slide to see, but I'll walk you through some of the main points. Some of the biggest costs associated with, respiratory, or with nitrogen pollution, human respiratory health is one of the biggest ones. It's the one that we've known the most about for a long time. So when we when we burn fossil fuels, we put NOx into the atmosphere and particulates, and those cause respiratory problems. And so that directly relates to um, hospital visits and mortality. And so those are things that economists are very good at quantifying the damage costs associated with. There's also lost work associated with hospital visits. And so those are things that economists have done a really good job, thank you, have done a good job of putting a dollar value on. And so those have pretty high values. Those are things that we, as a society value uh, quite a bit. Um, we also have greenhouse gas damages on here. So that's the release of N2O, and we took the cost of carbon, social cost of carbon numbers that were available when we did this paper. And we can also see that those are fairly high, $20, $10 per kilogram. The, the human health impacts are in the $20 per kilogram. Um, some of the other effects that we see are effects on eutrophication and biodiversity. There's a lot of research showing that deposition of nitrogen, um, release of nitrogen to fresh waters affects the biodiversity of those systems and that people care about some of those changes and, so, and, and also um, things like algal blooms and hypoxic areas. Those are things that we can, we can relate to recreation or changes in fisheries, things that we can put, um, put values on. And then um, groundwater and coastal systems. The coastal system number is also fairly high. Um, we actually had some really high numbers from the Gulf Coast 
The highest number in the whole study that we published was $56 per kilogram associated with damage to seagrass beds. And so increasing nitrogen, covering up the seagrass beds with algae, the, algae, the seabeds would die, and then you lose that system. And so that was one of our high, very highest costs. But I didn't feel comfortable just taking that number and applying it to the entire U.S. So, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, variation here in the, the two different numbers are kind of the range of data that's out there from Europe, and then the one in the middle is the one that we chose to use for our study. There's a lot of holes here. There's some things like tr uh, health costs of uh, halves, of harmful algal blooms. We don't have good data on that. We don't have good data on um, the uh, effects of HABs on fish kills. We just don't keep good records on that. We don't have a lot of economists looking at that. And so there's definitely some gaps. So we put all these numbers together. We multiply our nitrogen release to the environment by these damage costs. We see these are big, very big numbers. So our, this um, paper was published in uh, Environmental Research Letters last year. We saw a total of about $200 billion in the U.S. damages associated with um, release of nitrogen in the environment. The sources that relate back to agriculture are 150, about 160 sources for fossil fuel. Even though it's not as large a source, it has very important human health impacts, and so it has a concomitant um, high impact on the, the damages that we see. And even sewage, sewage is a small proportion at the scale of the U.S., but it still has important impacts. And then you can see there's a large range. This is very similar to what they found in the EU nitrogen assessment, the numbers that they see and a very, very large range associated with these damages. And just to kind of spatially show the, the uh, uh, release, this is anthropogenic release to the environment. So this is, um, this is taking that input information and running it through some model coefficients to say what's released to the environment. And so what's released to groundwater, what's released to surface waters, what's released back up into the atmosphere. And so I'm sorry, Iowa is a big hot spot on, our, on your map, so we'll hear more about Iowa later. Um, one thing that we didn't do in this work is really do complicated flow modeling. So we don't actually even have the tile drain systems in Iowa in this model. We just have basically a, cal a calculator that says, this is how much we think fertilizer is running off. We don't necessarily have a spatially explicit model that incorporates the, the tile drain. So you can see a lot of the hot spots. There's big uh, cathos in, uh, cal uh, can you guys see if I do this? Do you see an arrow? Okay, in, in, in uh, the Eastern, Carol or Eastern Carolinas, big uh, CAFOs, or, and then de the, you can see the Chesapeake Bay is a hot spot. The San Joaquin Sacramento is also a big hot spot. And then I just pulled out the freshwater damage costs. They kind of relate to those, um, to those high, uh, high inputs that, that we showed before, the Chesapeake, the upper Midwest, the, the California systems. These numbers compare with other numbers that are out there. I was kind of thinking, well, these are very high numbers. Maybe they're kind of outlandish. But when we started looking at other values, the EU assessment says something like 100 to 600 billion dollars in damages. Um, other things that have looked at uh, air damages, just the particulates associated with ammonia from food export. This is a paper from, from Harvard, from ESMT a couple years ago, 36 billion US dollars for the human health impact. So human activities have increased nitrogen fixation by, by fivefold in the US. About 65% of that nitrogen goes into agriculture. About 71% of that that's released ends up in water, either groundwater, freshwater, or coastal systems. The nitrogen damage costs are substantial, and we, we still have a lot of gaps. I feel like there's many things like drinking water impacts that we don't have a good handle on. Um, so my, my goal here is not to, to be super negative, but my goal is to provide a framework for people to think about all of the different impacts so that you have a place to put an impact that you're thinking about and so that these, these kinds of impacts are, are, are credited and accounted for in, our, in the way we look at environmental regulations and turning, going back to turning those valves. Where do we need to turn those valves? So with that, I will end. And I'm over time, so I'm going to stop. But can I say one more thing? Yes. So um, I meant to add a slide on this, and I forgot. So 
I work with Jim Galloway at the University of Virginia, and he's developed um, with the International Nitrogen Initiative the nitrogen footprint calculator. And since I have a captive audience of people interested in nitrogen, if you haven't heard of it, I would suggest that you look at it. It tells you your food, energy, your airplane travel um, costs, and it's an individual calculator, so it's a way for you to look at your own um, your own nitrogen footprint. We're using it, and we're developing an institutional calculator that colleges can use. If anybody hears from a university and is interested in applying that in your university, we're going to have a website where you can actually do that, um, and, and we do have a manual and a calculator that I could hand off to you if there if there's folks that are interested in being part of the the end print network. So I'm just going to write the website on the, on the board. So I have a board. All right, thank you very much. Sorry to go a little bit over. <clears throat> and our next speaker will be Sonia Brook from uh, UC Davis. She's uh, on the faculty of UC Davis and has been very much a, um, a lead on the California nitrogen assessment, as I understand it. Yes, thank you. Uh, so is it in this folder? Does somebody know? Oh, it's on the desktop. I should have just oh. like, you close mine. It's on the desktop. It should be on the desktop. You should see it. I'm sorry, which <laughs> under pressure, I'm very bad at doing this. Full screen mode. Yeah. Full screen you keep on going down. Yeah, it's yeah so try full screen mode. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank oh, you. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so can we walk? <coughs> All right, so I'm going to be talking about nitrogen in California agriculture, and the uh, information is all coming from a multi-year project that we've been working on at the Agricultural Sustainability Institute at UC Davis called the California Nitrogen Assessment. And actually, the big news is after all these years, it's going to be published by UC Press on May 31st this year. Um, and you'll find a lot more information about it on our website as well. Um, this has been something that's involved about 40 or so different authors and different areas of expertise across many institutions, including outside of the University of California system. So it's, it's been basically a big assessment of what do we currently know about nitrogen in California um, based on, and where are the uncertainties also, based on existing research and existing data. We did not do any new uh, data collection in this. And so um, it follows the format of an ecosystem assessment model, and uh, this is a very stakeholder-driven process where we engage with stakeholders across the state, and they gave us questions that they had about nitrogen issues in California. And there were at least 100 different questions, but they kind of break down into these categories of what are the big sources of nitrogen pollution? What are the impacts of nitrogen management on society and human health? What practices are available for mitigating nitrogen pollution? And also, what are the policy challenges and opportunities? And so I'm going to talk particularly about the first two things a lot and just touch very briefly on the second two. Um, but one thing we did to quantify the sources of nitrogen pollution is to do a statewide nitrogen mass balance. So that's quantifying all of the flows of nitrogen into and out of the state and all the different transformations it takes from one system to another or one medium to another, and just using existing data that could be put together. So there's a lot of uncertainties in a lot of these numbers, but I can just walk you through on what we found uh, so far. And this is based on a reference year of 2005, or as close to that as we could get for some data. And so we can see that as far as the new, the inputs of new nitrogen into the state, 
Uh, fertilizer is the biggest source there, this uh, big chunk here. Um, as Jan Ellen said, the fossil fuel combustion accounts for a lot of nitrogen in terms of NOx emissions, but then the other two big areas are also due to agriculture. Um, and another way to look at this is to look at different land uses. So this has crop land, urban land, and natural land, and we also, as just as land uses, and then we threw into this graph also livestock as a separate sort of sector in the mass balance, and people and pets, which is just the food and the waste coming from actual human bodies and pet bodies. Um, and again, you can see that crop land is bringing in most of the new nitrogen in terms of fertilizer, and also using manure, and livestock brings in a lot of imported feed and nitrogen in that feed, and so that um, accounts for a lot of the new nitrogen coming into the state compared to the other land uses. You can see how much agriculture accounts for that. Um, this does not, none of this includes fossil fuels, by the way, which was sort of a separate analysis in the mass balance, but that, if you added that in, that would, of course, increase um, the new nitrogen in each of those sectors. Um, and so now in terms of the outputs and the storage, um, first you can see that food, that, that's actually the food produced by agriculture in the state, only accounts for, or the nitrogen in that food only accounts for 5% of all of these flows of nitrogen going out of the state or going from one place to another within the state, only 5%. Um, the rest, the two big ones, again, are NOx emissions from fossil fuel burning, and then there's a lot of nitrate going into groundwater and staying there, so that's a really big uh, area. And um, the ammonia at the bottom, the 12%, that's also uh, primarily from livestock production. And another, this is just another way to look at the same, similar information. You can look at the sizes, relative sizes of the arrows there. Again, the one, the orange arrow on the bottom in the center is the nitrate going into groundwater. And it's about 64% estimated from fertilizer and 36% from manure used on cropland. Um, and then again, we have the big arrow going up into the air. That's the ammonia from manure primarily. And again, a separate from just agriculture, but the fossil fuel NOx emissions are quite large as well. And then there's various other smaller arrows. Um, and again, looking at it according to the land uses and then also livestock and people and pets, you can see how the cropland Interestingly, actually, the two uh, green, the dark green and the light green at the top of the cropland bar, that's the food and the feed being produced by cropland, the nitrogen in the food and feed produced by cropland. And so that's only about half of the bar, so the other half of the nitrogen is going elsewhere. So nitrate in groundwater, again, is the biggest piece, and ammonia production also. Um, and the same with the livestock bar are actually even worse, but the livestock, the actual food produced is just that small section there, and then the rest goes into manure, which goes to cropland or other places, and also ammonia emissions. So um, what are the impacts of all these flows in the state? So we looked at what research there was on this, and again, there's a lot of uncertainty, as Jana also mentioned. Um, but there's water impacts and there's air impacts. And so um, in terms of groundwater nitrates, um, areas in the, the southern or the San Joaquin Valley and the Salinas Valley, just, just across the mountains, are some of the worst places for nitrate pollution um, in the groundwater. Um, there's around, give or take, about 10% of the wells test um, are above the, um, the maximum contaminant load for nitrates, and more than twice as much test, you know, halfway there, so very much more than the ambient nitrate con concentration should be in that well water. Um, and I might just mention that all the curves go up at the end of that chart because that's when they started also including uh, dairy test wells wells on dairies in the database, which were not included before, drinking water wells are deeper and have less nitrate, 
But when you include those dairy wells, your nitrate goes up a lot as far as your database goes. Um, so there's also air pollution effects. So some of it, there's ozone, which is uh, form it, formed from NOx emissions. And there's particulate matter. So again, a lot of the ozone is more a result of fossil fuel burning as opposed to agriculture per se. The uh, particulate matter comes from ammonia emissions, so that's more attributable to agriculture. And again, the San Joaquin Valley, where a lot of our agriculture is in the state, um, is one of the worst places as far as air quality uh, considerations. And indeed, there's a lot of environmental justice concerns associated with this because when you look at the concentrations of um, where some of the worst groundwater is in terms of nitrate pollution and the worst air quality, they're all kind of located in that Central Valley location in the San Joaquin Valley part of the Central Valley. And in fact, a lot of the affected people are often the most economically disadvantaged and also minority groups. And so there's significant environmental justice concerns for this pollution. Um, as far as what we found on actual um, quantification of costs, so um, for just for comparison purposes, the food production and the, the positive value of using this nitrogen and in terms of this positive service of producing food, just in the San Joaquin Valley alone, that's estimated to be about $28 billion value per year. Um, and then the air quality, I'm sorry, this is a little confusing. In the earlier slide, we saw, I think, $6 billion um, from a Hall et al. study that uh, is, if, uh, is the human health impact, including, I think that, that number is more comprehensive than the smaller number here, that included days missed at work, uh, missed school days, reduced activities for adults affected by uh, respiratory problems and so on. So that was a number of about six billion effects of air quality in the San Joaquin Valley alone. And then drinking water, it's even harder to quantify what the impacts are in terms of dollars. But I looked at one study where they had, um, they listed out between the years of 2005 to 2009, the projects that were being uh, requested from the state government in terms of um, nitrate remediation for community drinking uh, water systems. And there, were, there was about $150 million worth of proposed projects, and of those, 21 million worth, or six, six projects got funded. So, and that's not, that's only counting those that apply to the state for funding to address nitrate. There's probably a lot more uh, impacts that are not captured in those numbers. So, can you just clarify that slide? So, are you saying that we should compare those costs with the $28 billion of value in agriculture? Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the $28 billion is the, uh, the value, the positive value coming out of the agricultural system, and then here are some of the negative costs. And you were saying that. Health fund was $6 billion, but it says it's $5 million. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just realized that this morning, but it's from this, at the top there, $6 billion is if all of the ozone and particulate matter standards were met, that would be the savings to health costs uh, that happen now because of this pollution. <laughs> sorry, yeah, I'm going a little fast because I have one minute left. <laughs> So we did also, we look at um, several other areas in addition to just these problem areas. We look at uh, practices that there are available for reducing um, some of these issues in agriculture. And there's some research out there that is showing that there's, a, first of all, there's a lot of difference between farms in terms of their nitrogen use efficiency. And there's also a lot of difference between the average values of nitrogen use efficiency on farms versus um, the research values that are obtained on experimental plots. And so this suggests that there's room for improvement, basically, and there's many practices that can improve that. The same in livestock production. There's a lot of differences between different dairies, suggesting that there's possibility to improve systems. And finally, I want to, because I think we're going to probably, most likely, probably someone's going to bring up a, a policy uh, discussion today. And I wanted to say that we have an entire chapter assessing the possibility of different policies, uh, different policy instruments for 
remediating problems. And nitrogen being a non-point source pollution issue, um, it's very challenging, um, but there's, there's a definitely a whole assessment I can maybe talk some more about later. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Yeah. So our next speaker is Laurie Drinkwater. She's a professor in the School of Integrative Plant Science at Cornell University, um, focusing on understanding mechanisms governing carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus cycling in agroecosystems from field to landscape scale. Okay. Well, thank you all for being here. I think that you know nitrogen is it's just really really fascinating. So I'm glad we have. Why isn't it working? It's always tricky to use somebody else's laptop. Now it's not doing anything. It's like it stuck. Did it go down there? There, oh, there it is. You go. Okay. Took me a minute to get it. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> okay. So, um, well, I get to talk about a um, a solution. So I'm not really going to be throwing around any dollars, and I'm and I'm also not saying this is the complete and total solution, but it's an example of an approach we could take. And um, so I'm going to start by talking a little bit about some biology and ecology. So why are agricultural systems leaky? And then um, introduce an idea of, of um, ecological intensification, which is an alternative approach to sustainability. And then I'll talk about legumes and how they differ from the fertilizer that we're so dependent on um, right now. So. Is that going to move me? What's good? There we go. All right. So why are, why are these systems so leaky in the first place? And we have to sort of step back and think about how we've really changed the structure of agriculture. And this was enabled by the um, agrochemicals, which are all you know, fueled by fossil fuels and energy. And this is from a study of the Midwest, which found that if you look over this period of decades, as energy use goes up in agriculture, plant diversity goes down. So they're inversely related. So as you rely more and more on energy from fossil fuels, you can eliminate the diversity in the landscape that was providing these services that support production, such as nitrogen fixation or habitat for natural enemies or weed suppression, all kinds of things. And this has been found in, in other landscapes, too, when they look at it. So then, if you just look at um, the agricultural systems we have today with fertilizer, and this is just for some of the main grain crops, even though we're adding plenty of fertilizer, and I want to point out that over-application of fertilizer is, is one of the problems, but it is not the primary problem. Um, the problem is just has to do with the biology, how plants take nitrogen, and how inorganic nitrogen behaves when you put it in the soil. So, these crops that are getting plenty of fertilizer are still getting the majority of their nitrogen from soil organic matter from the soil. So some fertilizer does cycle back into organic matter, about 20% on average in these types of systems. Um, but we're still, you know, plants are very stubborn and they still want to get their nitrogen from soil organic matter and partner with microbes. That's how they evolved. So we have this problem. Um, that nitrogen leakiness is systemic. We're basically giving farmers a very, very difficult uh, material to manage and keep in their system. And this is partly because the inorganic forms of nitrogen, particularly nitrate, which in ammonium can be converted very rapidly to nitrate, are very mobile and there are many lost pathways, uh, many of which are mediated by microbes. So it's very difficult to keep it in the system. Um, therefore, farmers must add surplus nitrogen. So, you know, even with very, very efficient management, unless you basically can fertigate, so if you can put the nitrogen in with irrigation water and drip it right next to the plant, you're going to have these losses when you add inorganic nitrogen or very simple forms of nitrogen, such as urea, that break down quickly into nitrate, um, which is lost. So, um, the other thing is because of the change in our, our rotations and the plants we're growing, we have long periods of bare fallow. So plant uptake in, in time is reduced. There's <coughs> lots of times when the fields have no plants growing, they're not taking up nitrogen. So what's going to happen to nitrogen that's released by the microbes during this time? It's going to be lost to the environment. 
So then you keep going into the next step and the consequences um, for organic matter, um, because we've got plants growing for less time. We're not putting as much carbon in, we're putting nitrogen in by itself. And over time, we've lost organic matter from the soils, which is basically the food for microbes. And with less organic matter, the microbes are not going to be taking up as much nitrogen at you know, key times. If, if they had energy, they would capture nitrogen, but they don't. Um, so nitrogen is really you know, a waste product, and this pushes the loss pathways even further. So it, you know, it is important to do as much as we can to manage fertilizer um, in a you know, to do a better job, but that's not going to be the only solution. And, you know, this has gotten a lot of focus. So right now, I think you actually heard the more crop per drop approach. This is an incremental approach to um, improving the efficiency of agricultural systems. It's, very, it's a very important approach, but it's really not going to fundamentally change things. And I think in the case of nitrogen, you know, we can get so far um, but there's, you know, we are not going to reach sustainability by, by this approach alone. So an alternative approach that has been proposed and that's getting a lot of attention is called ecological intensification. And so this is where we would actually try to reduce what's happened in agriculture over the past, you know, 50 or 60 years, where we would restore ecological integrity as a way to reduce our dependency on fossil fuel-based inputs. So one of the fundamental approaches in ecological intensification is to increase biodiversity, not just random biodiversity, but to increase it in a way that is intentional and is based on all the ecological knowledge that we've gained since the Green Revolution was first introduced. So our understanding of natural systems um, has grown tremendously since the 1940s and 1950s when we went down this you know, chemical and technological pathway. So a lot, of, um, a lot of this is based on using plants to replace chemicals, that's sort of one idea, or enhance ecological processes. And plants can basically can provide all of these services that I've listed here. Um, legumes are one example. Perennialization is, is another. Um, using diversity to enhance pollination and natural enemies is, is another. Um, so there's some legumes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the basics of nitrogen fixation. Um, and I apologize for those of you that already know all about it, but I get a lot of questions. For example, my father said, why is nitrogen a problem? There's plenty of it up in the air. Um, and so, you know, in, um, unfortunately, plants and animals cannot access this nitrogen. And so microbes solved this problem a long time ago. Um, and until we invented the Haber-Bosch process, so until we were able to, to um, fix nitrogen using fossil fuels, we were all completely dependent, and as was all life on Earth, on the microbes that ca can fix nitrogen from the air. And, and this is basically taking nitrogen gas, which has a very strong bond, um, and breaking it. And microbes can basically use any form of nitrogen, and there's some microbes that can use anything. Plants can use ammonium and nitrate, which we can. We need organic forms, um, which are over there in the corner. And so the bacteria that can fix nitrogen are everywhere. Um, they're most active when they're associated with plants because they get plenty of carbon. It's still a high energy um, process. So it takes a lot of energy when we make it. We have to use a lot of fuel, fossil fuel, and bacteria need a lot of carbon. Um, and the most important nitrogen fixers in agriculture are those associated with legumes, which we've barely tapped. So the estimate is that there's 12,000 species, and we're using six for 95% of the nitrogen that we fix. So, you know, soybeans, alfalfa, red clover, I don't know what the other big ones are. Can't remember right now. <laughs> so what do legume-based cropping systems look like? Well, first of all, um, organic grain systems are our great example, and we study those as a model system to try to understand how nitrogen carbon cycling is different when, when we rely on legumes as a nitrogen source. So they're getting about 80% of their nitrogen from legumes. And the way that happens is um, legumes are also called green manures are grown in rotation. So for example, in a grain system, um, they would often be planted um, in the late fall following a small grain, such as wheat. And then they overwinter as a 
you know, dormant stage, and then um, they're incorporated into the soil uh, before the corn. Um, so that's one scenario. So the nitrogen that that plant has fixed is then released through decomposition. And there's a lot of issues to resolve in terms of the timing, and there's lots of things we can work on to make this more efficient. But what we do know is that um, legume-based systems that are using green manures are more efficient compared to fertilizers. So you can get, and so the way to look at this is this is the improvement in the total nitrogen recovery, and, and the error bars can't overlap with zero here. So we, we see some improvement with like nitrification inhibitors. We see pretty significant improvement when you switch from fall application to spring. But the greatest um, increase in recovery happens when you use organic sources and you know green manures are, are one example and that's where actually where we have the most data. There are other benefits though besides just this improvement in recovery and reduced losses to the environment and one is um, that we increase the storage of nitrogen in soil organic matter so the reserves in soils are increased and this is showing that as you increase the dependence on nitrogen fixation, so at this end, some you know, fertilizers going in, um, and that as you get down here, these are organic grain systems, they're most, almost entirely dependent on nitrogen fixation, then you have an increase in the soil organic nitrogen reserves. Another consequence of this is that each year then, you, you don't have to add as much nitrogen. So you can get off that nitrogen treadmill of having to add so much nitrogen each year because your soils don't have the ability to supply as much to the crop. Okay, then so now just going down the road of other benefits, and, and this is where I need an economist to start putting some, well not cost, but values on, <laughs> on these. So um, the increases in organic matter not only affect nutrients, one minute, uh-oh, I'm going to have to talk really fast now. No. <laughs> not only affect uh, nitrogen and carbon, but also soil tilth and um, water holding capacity. And we can see striking effects. This is from when I was working at Rodale Institute. These plots are in the same soil, organic management, so with legumes, conventional with fertilizer. The conventional corn has that pineapple syndrome because of drought. Um, so, we have many benefits. I already talked about them. What's the catch? <laughs> Why aren't we using legume nitrogen or legumes more predominantly? Um, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> um, I'm going to just talk a little bit, think about what, I mean, we can talk about the barriers during the discussion, but I was thinking a little bit, what would it take, I'm going to just put them all up there, um, to shift from industrial to ecologically based systems. So, Legumes are only one example. Um, we all agree that, okay, I won't say it. <laughs> we'll no, do it. Oh, I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> so we all agree that food production is too important to let the market determine you know, how it's done and what it costs. So we do have policies in place, but unfortunately, they are reinforcing and encouraging the system that we already have. Um, and you know, I think the first thing would be to eliminate all yield-based incentive programs. Um, and, the, and unfortunately, you know, there are conservation programs, but the, the um, incentives tied to yield far outweigh any payments for conservation practices, so that's a big problem. Um, I am not very comfortable with the idea of, cons you know, taxes for farmers. I think they're sort of stuck in this big agricultural industrial complex that generates the technologies that are available to them. So I'd rather see carrots for farmers, so incentives for practices that we know um, reduce the dependence on fossil fuel-based inputs or agrochemicals. Um, you could also have those sorts of incentives, incentives for the agro-industrial complex, but we could tax the agro-industrial agro complex. I'm a little more, I'm more in favor of that. Tax them for <laughs> fossil fuel-based dependent technologies. That would, you know, be brought. And that's all I'm going to say. I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. And so now we have uh, two somewhat shorter presentations, which are more along the line of respondents, are sort of showing um, what what a response is being generally to the issues that have been raised. Some responses, for example, from Bill Stow, who will talk to us about the. Um, 
he's the chief executive and general manager of the Des Moines Waterworks, uh, which is a utility that must protect public health and promote economic development. So he has got a big nitrate issue to deal with, and he'll talk to us about his response to that. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Anybody here a chess player? Speed chess. Five minutes. Seven minutes, I think, is what I've got. Six. Six minutes. Oh, my God. If I talk any more while I'm getting a drink of water, we'll be down to five. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the effect of nutrient pollution, particularly nitrate pollution, on water providers, particularly in the Midwest. I'm from Iowa. I-O-W-A. I could put it up there on the board. I-O wildlife and apology. My state has been denuded uh, to provide corn and soybean opportunities, essentially. Um, if we were a country, we would be the third and fourth largest producers in the world of corn and soybeans. In the United States, we're the number one corn producer, we're the number one soybean producer. The state I live in has three million people, 21 million hogs. So to give you an idea what intensive agriculture means as we sit in this beautiful state, where agriculture has a completely different meaning than it does in my area of the world. Uh, here you talk about farm laborers and you talk about family farmers. Um, I am from a capital intensive, uh, non-farm labored world where my family that farms, farms 10,000 acres, a small portion of which they own, very capital intensive. Maybe one or two people assist them in that process. Let me tell you a little bit or show you a little bit about the impacts of that kind of intensity of agriculture on providing drinking water. I've heard some terms thrown around today that from a practitioner's standpoint, I want to kind of focus in on for a moment. Most of us get our drinking water not from groundwater, but from surface water. I'm a surface water provider. I'm drawing water from two uh, intra-state and interstate rivers that are tributaries to the Mississippi River and Gulf Coast hypoxia to provide drinking water for the population base that I serve. Those watersheds are about 10,000 square miles. Overwhelmingly, again, intensively uh, row crop farmed, but also animal feeding operation, CAFO farmed. The nitrogen can come largely in our context from anhydrous ammonia, or from manure application. Very little of it is unfortunately, as you've seen in some of the discussion about the nitrogen cycle, uh, organic nitrogen coming from the soils. Let me try to throw up quickly some slides if I can find them in this interesting process of using somebody else's PC as we talked about before. Oh yeah, I can do it. A little instruction, even I can do it. Without my glasses, I may find it a little bit more challenging. Oh, I think I got it. I think I got it. Okay. I'm, well, I thought I had it. Maybe not so much. Do we? Okay, excellent. Yeah, I have a little bit different view than you all do. I'm going to talk about uses, particularly in the intensive world of agricultural watersheds. Remember that nutrients from a water pollution standpoint are not just nitrogen, they're also phosphorus. But from a drinking water standpoint, I'm far more interested in nitrogen because that's more difficult for me to remove than phosphorus. Phosphorus generally travels with soils, and so are the processes most of us use in my business to remove suspended solids, soils, takes care of the phosphorus issue. Nitrogen travels with water, uh, and it's far more difficult for us to deal with. Great picture of the world that I come from. On the left are 21 million of my fellow Iowans, at least uh, symbolically. On the right is an example of the intensive row crop farming that I deal with. Notice the less than generous buffer between the anhydrous uh, application you see and a waterway. We'll talk about pathways of nitrogen into water. Hmm, that may be a pretty direct one. Also heard some discussion about runoff and non-point source pollution. In the world of agriculture that I come from, agricultural pollution is a point source polluter. And we are suing, um, that is the entity that I work for, that I'm responsible for, is suing county governments upstream as point source polluters under the Clean Water Act because these things called drainage tiles 
drain the soils in my part of the very intensively productive corn belt, uh, drain the soils with tile to directly to the waterways, essentially a meter beneath the soil, about the lectern size. If that's the top of the beautiful black soil you see in the inset with emerging corn, about the depth to the floor is where there's 10 by 10 centers and flexible tile that moves that water laterally out to the waterways of the state. They are point source polluter. Wow, one minute, holy mackerel. Yeah. The process they use are called drainage districts. Uh, these public tiling systems, public private tiling systems, you can see in our hydrogeology, very intensive. Those are our waterways and our watersheds, the Des Moines and Raccoon Rivers. Wow, that's not Mars, that's Iowa, folks, before the crops come up. Think there's any natural hydrology left in that? That's moving an intensity of water in terms of both quantity and a low quality of water filled with nitrates uh, into our waterways. And I know most of you understand the difference between the loading and concentrations, but this was the first month of this year kind of a longitudinal look at nitrate loadings going down the rivers immediately adjacent to our plants relative to what you'd see in a normal year or in other years, I should say. Quite an exponential jump, huh? Nitrate concentrations, the red card, oh my God. Soccer players here? <laughs> Somebody's gonna get a free kick uh, because I'm not quite done. Nitrate concentrations, extraordinarily important from a public health consequence, the risk group is largely the very young, at least that that's been identified. There's a research going on now to look at a wider pool, but it's essentially six months or younger, uh, very susceptible to blue baby syndrome. Uh, nitrate concentrations really on an annual basis showing significant variation, but the curve certainly weighs towards the more recent years as we think drainage systems and the intensity of use of anhydrous in particular is uh, knocked up, gone up significantly. Little economics, obviously a lot easier to remove nitrates at the field by infield activities or edge of field activities than it is in my business treating it downstream. We're about ready to make an $80 million construction uh, to try and deal with nitrate concentration removal. We now have the world's largest nitrate removal facility. It's about to uh, be run into the ground, unfortunately, by too often at the use. Uh, I won't talk about conservation practices because we really don't, but ultimately what I'm talking about is agricultural accountability. There's not another business. I think I've got a picture like that. Oh, more natural hydrology, huh? Uh, not so much. Not another business in my state and in the industrial Midwest that can take a pipe from their business, run it to the waters of the state or the U.S. and not be regulated. That is unregulated. That's a problem. 10% um, of the nitrate loadings or nitrogen loadings in my state are from sewage treatment plants, as an example, heavily regulated or municipal storm sewer systems like you'd have here in San Francisco. 90% of the nitrate problem or nitrogen problem are, is from agriculture. What do we regulate? The 10%, what do we leave unregulated? The 90%. Wonder why we had to sue to make a point? That, I think, takes my, I just lost it, speed chess. Oh, damn it. I'll get it all ready for you. Thank you very much. Is that vast increase in, in fertilizer application or in nitrates more recently from the low cost of fertilizer? Is that? It's a huge issue. Our state has an economic development initiative to bring lower cost nitrogen producers there. Yeah. So we're oh. driving down the cost of yeah. the nitrogen use. Yeah. The reality is, and it was mentioned in one of the earlier presentations, our growing season is six months. Uh, if you can find something, cover crops as an example, to better use the other six months in terms of nitrogen use, that's yeah. a huge portion yeah. of the answer. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. So our last respondent is Mark uh, Muller, who's the program director for the Mississippi River Program at the McKnight Foundation, and he was previously, previously with the Institute of Agriculture, Trade, and Policy. Thank you. I just first want to say I don't think we can underestimate what, what Bill Stone Des Moines Waterworks has done in the Midwest. And every week in the Des Moines Register, you will read about Bill, sometimes not flatteringly, uh, <laughs> and he's made this conversation happen. It's really remarkable. Um, for my response, actually, I wanted to do a little role play. Uh, we are in a, pretend we're in a McDonald's right now, and you are the cashiers at the McDonald's. I walk in. You've seen me many times before. I've always ordered a Big Mac, fries, and a Coke. 
This time I come in, and you expect me to say, I want a Big Mac, fries, and Coke. I come in and say, I just read the study. You are giving me diabetes. How can you be giving me all this fat and sugar? I, I, I thought you were my friend. I trusted you. What is going on here? How, how do you respond to that? I, if you as a cashier, what would you say? It's what you wanted. It's what you wanted. You bought it. You bought it. Very good. Right? Think of my manager. <laughs> exactly. These are excellent. These are all what I was hoping would happen. It's over my pay grade. <laughs> over your pay grade. It's only three dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so you you are being accused of giving me diabetes, and you're saying, well, first of all, I'm just you know I'm a manager. You know, blame my manager. Don't blame me. And you can say you you ordered this. You ordered this. Look at the menu. You could have ordered a salad or something, but you ordered the Big Mac and fries. Say I would like to just envision that you are a farmer. And you might be, and I am an urban dweller in Minneapolis. And think of it that way as I have ordered corn for years and years and years. You know, either through our policies, through you know, ethanol, through feedlots. I've ordered corn over and over again. All of a sudden I'm coming up to you and saying, you've hurt me. You've hurt me with your corn. I want something different. Not saying that that is a fair response, but many farmers feel that way. There are many farmers that are feeling like, you have broken the trust that we've had. Uh, and so that's one of the challenges that we have as farmers. I've been growing corn for decades. I've got my combine. I've got everything I've put in is for corn and soybean production. And now you're saying you don't want it, and you're blaming me for what is going wrong. That is one of the challenges, I think, that we're facing in the Midwest. And part of what we are trying to do at the McKnight Foundation is trying to figure out how, how do we empower farmers and others to feel like they can make decisions that they have the ability to go beyond growing corn and soybeans. Um, and I think there's a couple of different approaches. You know, we do not take a, a stance in terms of regulatory, non-regulatory. I think we need all aspects of it. But I think we need all farmers to do something. And so that's one of the things we've been saying. Is just we, we can't just have, water quality is one of those issues where you just can't have a few farmers doing really good and then have them ignore the rest. We need everybody to participate. And so one of the things we have to do is have everyone do a little bit better. Um, and it could be a regulatory approach or it could be something else. Uh, you know, just down the hall, uh, Craig Cox from Environmental Working Group is doing some really interesting work. One of them is just saying, we need to have like essentially a standard of care for agriculture. Just pick two of these concepts and do, just do a couple of these. Let's just move that bar, you know, the bottom bar, let's move that up a little bit. So that's one thing that we've been supporting our efforts like that. Another thing is to provide those other options for the more um, progressive, for the farmers that are more willing to go out and do and take a little bit more risk. Uh, working, for example, with the University of Minnesota in a group called Greenland's Blue Waters, they're trying to say, what else can we do besides corn and soybeans? How can we uh, get, a, there's a perennial wheatgrass, if people eat intermediate wheatgrass, which is a perennial called Kernza, that we're trying to get into the Midwest landscape. Perennials provide an enormous amount of benefits. You know, we're, we're based on these annuals of corn and soybeans. If we can get perennials in the landscape, we'll make a huge difference for soil and water. So using something like the, 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 the intermediate wheatgrass, hazelnuts, where there's an effort to try to get hazelnuts, we can get as much oil production per acre as soybeans. Uh, we're trying to develop hazelnuts to do well in a northern climate like Minnesota. Uh, penny crust for cover cropping. You know, cover cropping is another step that feels like it's fairly straightforward that we should move forward on. So I think that's one of the, the big things that we've been exploring, how we, we can make that empowerment happen. Uh, and then finally, what I just wanted to mention is kind of the other side of the coin, is how do we get the, um, the consumers and others to get involved and, and talk about water. And I just kind of wanted to talk about an experience I had about six weeks ago. And in the state of Minnesota, the governor of Minnesota he called the governor of the water summit. On a Saturday, anyone who wants to come, come and talk about water. So it was standing room only. We had over a thousand people that showed up to talk about water in Minnesota. It was quite remarkable. And he wanted to have this so that he could use this to kind of push his legislative agenda for next year. Um, and, and so anyway, who came there? Great representation by groups like Pheasants Forever. Great environmental groups in general were, were there in all spades. There were, uh, you know, public health officials were there. Uh, state agency people. We had, we had a great turnout from so many of these different constituencies. Environmental justice people were not there. Um, we did not have almost, it was a shocking, I would say the room was probably 95% white. Uh, such a lack of people of color that showed up there. We have not empowered groups to think that they can make a difference, they can get their issues heard. And it's hurting us. It's really hurting us in states like Minnesota where we don't have that. It's considered more of an upper middle class white issue and we have not kind of expanded that some. I think that's a crucial issue that we have to do to try to get 
these complicated issues that is, the scientists all talk about, how do you deal with nitrates, and get it so the general public has, has more of a, a, a stake in it right now. Um, one of the things that I just want to point out where I feel like we're really missing that is in terms of the creativity. And we've lost the creativity and the innovation on the landscape that could be there. And we have the dominant culture that's kind of got us into the corn and soybean mess that we have in the Midwest, and we're only looking at the dominant culture in terms of how we find solutions to that. It could come from that, but we have so many other opportunities. I mean, I've learned from working with farmers from all over the country and all over the world, there are many other ways of addressing these issues, but we're ignoring them right now because we just think we have one way of going forward. So I just want to leave it at that, empowering the farmers to make the decision we want to have, empowering the public to get more involved in these issues is, is a, one thing that we feel we have to do in order to go forward on these issues. Thanks. So, um, can we take questions from anybody? And if you will make your question to a, you could ask them of all the panelists if it's a general question, or tell us which panelists you would like for us to answer your question. Yeah. Oh yes. Okay. Uh, Lori. Uh, yes. Why um, are you against uh, incentive-based yield? Oh, incentives. When you have evidence that shows that uh, legumes and organics can have higher yield, it seems to me like supporting that would convince the growers to uh, take less CO2 from organics. Well, um, so organic practices don't necessarily always increase yields, in, you know, in, under all conditions. So under the drought conditions, um, the organic systems tend to be higher. On the average, in farmer practice, the yields in, in maize are lower in the Midwest. Um, not, you know, 10% lower, 15% um, percent lower. And that can be because of the corn variety. So, I mean, that's just on, on that. But I, I think that if you have um, yield-based incentives, which we actually have in organic agriculture quite a lot now because of the way the policy, you know, they, they need to fit within the system we have, that you're going to give short shift to the other outcomes that we need from agricultural lands, like all the other ecosystem services. And so because the market is already set up to really promote and favor yield and only recognize that in the, the economic setting, I think we just, to counter that, we need to focus on the ecological outcomes. And so I just, I just threw the, you know, tax fossil fuels or give incentives for non-fossil fuel-based practices because that can, you know, that can work out when you look at you know, managing insects or arthropod pests, for example, or, or managing nitrogen. So, but I'm open to other suggestions. I'm just not sure that we want to go down the rewarding yield path um, because we've already done that, and it, it, we we can't, you know, we we can't account for the other things we need if we focus on that. Can I take thirty seconds on yeah, incentives? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, the idea of profit maximization, I think, is a little overstated. You know. Economics 101 teaches us, you know, we have maximize our profits and we have perfect information. The real world of uh, production agriculture uh, does not have perfect information. There are cultural issues in my area of the world that discount research that says the right crop rotation and use of legumes, use of alfalfa, use of soybeans, instead of just king corn, actually provides a higher bottom line. That information is out there uh, and pretty clear, I think, in some circles, but agricultural retailers, the people who you buy the seed from, the people who you may deal with through an extension service, your neighbors, what your family has done since the Green Revolution are a greater determinant, in my view, of behavior than economic issues. So you may think that you can incent certain outcomes uh, but my sense is subsidies are a great distorter anyway of the marketplace and imperfect information and cultural issues make the world that I come from very committed and very comfortable to corn on corn on corn, even though there's lots of information from a market standpoint that would indicate uh, different inputs would be even more profitable. So perfect information and the strategic location of some very important players, egg retailers, uh, choke off what otherwise might be appropriate incentives. 
And certainly the, the yield metric is a very simple one and easy for people to understand. Probably for policymakers, it's the most straightforward. But if you can imagine, if we try to work on, on the next farm bill and try to figure out how we can really introduce some of many of these subtleties, um, I think, you know... Well, you know, and yeah. one, one other thing Please. about yield is that we have focused on yield per land area, yield per acre. And so if we use other metrics like yield per, you know, fertilizer input or yield per you know, CO2 emissions or other <clears throat> environmental consequences, it, it is one way to make it, a, you know, a more balanced system. Yeah. But uh, Laura, you mentioned ecological intensification and, and the, the sort of ecosystem services that sustain agricultural productivity. And often, the, I think, economists tend to look at this in a way that, okay, that's just, that's just the same as fertilizer. You substitute legumes for fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And yet, to build that infrastructure, as you say, being able to build up a soil that really holds the health, the soil organic material, you can destroy that also in a year, perhaps by what you're applying to the soil. Maybe not in a year, but certainly with natural enemies, you can build up an infrastructure, a green infrastructure, and then destroy it in one year through pesticides. So there's, there, there is that nuance also of the time it takes to, to address right. these ecosystem services and ecological intensification. Right, and they're also connected to each other, yeah. too, and which true. economists don't like. Yeah. <laughs> one more thing about subsidies, if that's yeah. okay. And one other thing I think is important, is all subsidies are not the same, and that we had previously, when the New Deal and after we first started agricultural policy, we actually had uh, price support programs, which kind of gave a, a fair price to farmers, uh, and in return they had conservation plans that they implemented, so that we, we were getting something in return for that. You know, through, as someone mentioned Earl Butts era before, and since the 1970s, we had more and more of just, rather than price supports, we had just flat out subsidies. And so particularly for corn and soybeans and wheat and cotton, we just now just give out money and let the price go as low as possible, which benefits agribusiness far more, because they get to buy the corn and soybeans very cheaply, uh, and the farmer stays in business barely, and we as taxpayers pay for that, rather than having the marketplace pay for it with price supports. So we've had a shift in that, and I think we asked more from farmers in the past, and we've taken that away. Now we're trying to get it back, it's like with crop insurance, trying to get to the conservation compliance and crop insurance, and it's really hard. We're, we're making little itty bitty steps um, and paying a lot of money for it. Yeah. Ken? Uh, Ken Wilson. Um, this is really fantastic, and a um, hundred questions, but um, I was particularly struck, uh, Jane and Sonia, by your presentations, the, how much, um, how much systematic information is now available nationally at California level, uh, and how complicated this is. And um, I wonder if you could tell us, um, if you put your, obviously in a very different, different institutional situation, I mean, that, you know, when, you, when you put all this together, what is the, you know, what, what, what is the response, what can be the response of people in government to this level of complexity? And I, I didn't understand Sonia, fully California assessment, I wish I knew more. Um, I should have been tracking this. But you said it was a stakeholder process. So what did your stakeholders make of this, of this kind of information? Are they able to use this in ways to change it themselves? Or what, what's, ne what's necessary to turn this kind of fabulous geeky information into socio-political processes that can be to be used and so on? I'll, I'll start with the national perspective. So I looked through the book earlier today, and I couldn't find any other agency, federal government agency people besides me that are here. So first I went, oh, and then I went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get too bad. <laughs> it really is too bad. And so, you know, I think we don't really have folks from USDA that are at this meeting and hearing a lot of these things. And I, you know, I think that's unfortunate. I think that there's there is a role there, and I think we have to work with. Um, you know, if we're, we're going to talk about these kinds of large scale changes. We have to work across agency. We have to work with USDA. We have to work with the states to develop programs that are account that are accounting for these things. I, I'm really interested in monitoring programs. I think just monitoring and, and watching what's going on. The Platte River Basin in Iowa. There's guama there. There, there is a kind of a nutrient management plan that goes along with that, but it involves monitoring of the, well, the wells on each farm and looking at what's happening over time. And, and just having that information and then sharing that and have, making people accountable to what's going on on their farm, I think is really, is really important. So um, as far as the, the agency response, so I, the work that I've done, I had to give 10 briefings on this work. 
to get it published. It was very um, under kind of spotlight. I presented it to two undersecretaries of agriculture, uh, Ann Bartuska and Ann Mills. I presented it to the White, White House Council on Environmental Quality. So there's a lot of interest. As soon as you put a dollar value on things, there is a lot of interest. And so I think, you know, the, the agency response really is um, is trying to figure out what the right what the right things to do are. And I think um, that's that's a big challenge. And it, it ha at least from EPA's perspective, it has to be with other agencies and with the with the state um, state groups. That's a very very quick follow up then. So what do you hear from your colleagues in health or in agriculture? Do you hear that oh my God, you can't bring that even to us, or do you find people who there, no, there's there's a group at USDA that we've been working with on the reactive nitrogen question, just because that's where, where I work. We actually have a, a group, and we, we got together to talk about these issues. And one of the main points was, you know, how do we how do we keep you know how do we make the food that we need with, with less pollution? That was one of our big focal points of this of this conversation. And so um, it is. Really, uh, it is something that there are people, and many of those folks have retired since we had that workshop. So I have to bring, I'm going to have to find the new, the young people that are excited about this. So I hope it isn't something people get excited about right at the end of their career because they have the time to do this. So I, I wonder why, you know, why there are more agency folks that were able to come to this, this meeting. Question I have. Yeah, and we should go to Sonia next and then we'll come back here. Yeah, yeah um, that's a great question or a set of questions. Um, one thing, one of our biggest messages coming out of our assessment as a whole is that we need, I mean, you saw a lot of information being presented, but in fact, we found it was very hard to get a lot of this information, which is publicly held, in fact. Um, and so one of the biggest recommendations is that we need more uh, accessibility of all the statewide monitoring information that happens, and we need also, we need to get it, uh, we need to get the different agencies and the different actors within the government who take these different, collect these different types of data to talk to each other because there's a lot of, um, especially with nitrogen, you know, it goes from one form into another and yet the water data is kind of here and the air data is there, but there could be, you know, the more you're saving from going into the groundwater maybe means you have a bigger nitrogen pool going into the air, you know, there's, and all of these things need to communicate a lot more. Um, and one thing that is happening is um, there's now a new policy in some of the uh, regional water quality control boards in California to require farmers to create these nitrogen budgets. Uh, for their farms where they have to actually estimate all the nitrogen inputs going in and what they're taking out in their cr when they harvest their crop. And so that's partly a result of our study and also another study that was going on at the same time um, about these groundwater problems. Um, but you, I think you had we something say, more to... Are there, are there civil society stakeholder groups who are taking, you know, why is my county suffering this? Um, are they using the data like that? I think they are. We're just now, now that we finally finished the book, we're now going to start a whole outreach phase. So, um, but there's been stakeholders who've been on it all along the way with us. And some of those are environmental justice groups, clean water coalitions, and so on that are, you know, before I think there was a lot of finger pointing, like the agricultural sector would say, well, it's wastewater treatment that's causing the problem, or it's, it's the fossil fuels. And it is, I think it is helpful to have some of the numbers, even with some range of uncertainty, but to see that, well, no, this is really where it's probably coming from. And so I think these environmental justice groups definitely are going to be able to use it, and they've been in communication with us a lot about these, these in, uh, information, yeah. The, the USDA is in here because they protect the status quo and reduce it. Let's be serious, they're not protecting consumers. The Secretary of Agriculture is the former governor of Iowa. Um, I, I, we work with these people all the time. If we think that the USDA is the answer to cutting edge science and changing the public policy, wow. Uh, go home and have a nice strong drink. Wake up tomorrow, <laughs> reality will set in. Let's take some more questions here. Hi, Peter Bernalis from Natural Resources, Defense Council, and thanks all for your uh, work. 
So unlike some of my colleagues at this conference, I don't work on the programmatic side, and so I'm a bit of a lay person in this, and there's just a lot of technical information and sort of, I'm not super savvy in all of this, and so perhaps this is more of a comment, and perhaps this is a technical audience, so you're, you know, uh, done a good job of uh, sharing information in that way, technical, uh, technical information, but I think it'd be interesting to see more of like a narrative or a story of this is the current situation, this is the threat, and these are the solutions. And I appreciated the one slide that sort of clearly showed the takeaways. Um, so I appreciated that as sort of someone for whom this is dense, but a way of talking about it that makes more sense to someone who you know doesn't know all the technical details. So if that's yeah, that, in that the future of, of you know maybe there's a session on that tomorrow, right? How we communicate about this work so that people who don't know the science behind it can understand it in a way that makes it real yeah. for them. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And I think when we, you know, we, we agreed we can't get down to exact, I mean, there's so many risks when you get down to exact monetary values. Right. And, and I, you know, I would have some questions about some, some of the figures that you put up there where this is the benefit of food production and then this is the the cost, then it's a huge benefit. And none of those costs really sort of offset that. But is it really a trade off just between these monetary values? Could there not be a food production that, that is a different kind of food production? You know, that, that, so, and that's always when you put up the dollar numbers, then you start talking about trade offs. Is, but there may be something in between that. Um, and I also really appreciated your slide with where you were showing all the arrows and you were pointing out that there could be valves in all of those arrows. I think that might be something that the public could yeah. understand well. Yeah. And, to go dig, you know, deep into those valves and what we can do about them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the woman in the back. Hi, I'm Jenny Russell of the Community Water Center and work on nitrate solution with one of the rural communities in California. So this was fabulous. Thank you all so much. Um, and many things resonate. Um, I just want to say thank you, especially to Mark and Bill for talking about nitrate impacts on drinking water. And I was curious, um, Bill, when you were closing remarks about who's engaged in the conversations in the Midwest about how we get a handle on this problem, because in California we're groundwater impacts, not surface water, but um, the communities that are really driving change and pushing for a fertilizer fee, which could possibly even happen in California, I think in a way that it's not even close in other states, but our low-income communities, communities of color, farm-only communities that are really experiencing these impacts firsthand, and I think that's fascinating because if we continue on this track of agriculture as, as currently exists, um, nitrate pollution is going to impact everyone in the Central Valley, as what Sonia was getting at. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering if there are disproportionate impacts that you're seeing in the Midwest in terms of the impact of nitrogen on, on water or air, and just in general, what you're doing in your work to involve directly impacted communities, to involve communities of color, low income communities in this um, policy making and, and the, the process of trying to find solutions. Let me just, from a water producer's standpoint, let me just talk uh, briefly about the difference between groundwater and surface water in terms of nitrate pollution. Um, surface water quality is driven largely by human activities on the land. Uh, groundwater quality largely driven by geology. Uh, in the world that I'm from, that is to say nitrate concentration and legacy issues can affect it. The point is, there's a huge lag. There's not a lag in surface water quality. So, in my world, the rural areas are very groundwater oriented. The urban and suburban areas are very uh, surface water oriented. Hence, you see somebody from an urban suburban area uh, challenging what's going on in production agriculture. Rural areas have not uh, felt that consequence yet. They will. Legacy nitrate issues are very real. As some of the technical folks here on the on the uh, panel can talk about. But ultimately. What we're talking about, though, is a significant public health issue. Uh, we can nationalize it and internationalize it. That we're part of the Mississippi River Valley. Gulf Coast hypoxia is very real. I'm formerly a resident of New Orleans. Um, if we look at the impact of our industrial model, not only on local communities like mine, but on our states and on our country and on the Gulf, as an example, uh, we have a better sense that this is not a rural, urban, groundwater, surface water issue. Um, it's really an issue of intense uh, industrial agriculture. And I'm sure most of you realize 
that manufactured nitrogen was a transition from munitions in World War II to um, a different world, a world of the Green Revolution. Borlaug and I went also. Um, but it's having significant consequences that are very real, and it's shifting the cost of industrial agriculture away from the producers to the consumers of water, as an example, my constituents. I'll just say, I, I, I don't know what the answer is. Prior to my work now, I, I directed a fellow, the Food and Community Fellows Program that Kellogg Foundation supported. And it was all about food justice. And our meetings were so much fun that there was, people brought their whole selves to these gatherings. You know, they talked about their <coughs> cultural background, and what their grandmothers cooked. And it was, it was such a, a joy that people would bring to these issues. And then when I came to the McKnight Foundation and attended my first uh, hypoxia task force meeting, and a meeting of 100, 100 people, and it was incredibly boring, and no one brings their whole selves to that, and, and, and it's almost all white. And, and it, it, to me, it really kind of struck me, like, there's a real issue here that we are not kind of thinking beyond the dominant paradigm. And it, so I guess what I'm kind of interested in is that it feels like in other aspects of the food world, we have done a much better job of incorporating a multicultural approach. In, Water quality in particular, we have not at all. And I just, I don't know how to do that. You know, most of the people I see fishing in Minneapolis on the Mississippi River tend to be either Hmong or African American. Um, you know, there are so many reasons why it, it's an environmental justice mm -hmm. issue, but either how we're talking about it and how we raise the constituencies is just not working. So I, I'd welcome any ideas behind that. Good. Uh, Beth? Hi, yes, I'm Beth Smoker. I actually used to work with Barbara on the <laughs> and then I worked for the California Climate and Agriculture Network, CalCAN. Um, and I was surprised that climate change wasn't mentioned at all in these conversations. It could be, to your point about framing, that we were more in the details of nitrogen. Um, but it also was, you know, um, impacts the climate change, changing climate and agriculture is severely impacted by climate change, which is kind of the dual um, of causing, contributing to climate change, but then also um, being very harmed by it, but also able to adapt to changing climate. So I'm curious how, if climate change comes up in any of your framing of your discussions about nitrogen. We did have a damage associated with the N2O release. It was on the graph, I think I mentioned it. So it is part of the story, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's positive and negatives associated with nitrogen. There's release of particles that makes cooling, and so it's kind of a complicated story, but it's definitely part of the part of the, um, the dialogue. Well, yeah, I can say that actually that's, um, concerns about climate change is what first triggered the California Nitrogen Assessment. The Packard Foundation provided the initial funding for it, and they were very much worried about climate change at that point. And um, I mean, interestingly, we, what we found was it's really the amount going as N2O, you know, is really quite small in California relative to the whole um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions budget of the state. Uh, the N2O from agriculture is like in the single digits as far as percent of contrib contribution to climate forcing. Um, and it's really the groundwater issues that kind of came to dominate. So, so yeah, I mean, it's definitely part of the story, but it's not coming out as kind of the dominant thing right now. And yet, the, the Healthy Soils Initiative that's being discussed in California, but little I understand of it, which is very much related to climate change and the whole right, potential of multiple benefits. Right, funding is from the cap and trade program, and it must yeah. be something relating to greenhouse gas yeah. emissions yeah. reductions. Yeah. 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 Policy and right now, that at least in California, there's a lot of policy and money in climate change, and so that could be a source of mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and Absolutely. internationally, this is huge interest in yeah. catch per meal. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, Laurie. and you know, I I think that we actually don't have a really good handle on the nitrous oxide emissions that are coming from different agricultural mm -hmm. systems, either regionally or in terms of the you know profit system type, because. Um, some of it that's going out the bottom can eventually end up going out the top as nitrous oxide. And I think the other thing to remember is that nitrous oxide is like 300 times more potent than CO2 because of its longevity and its impact. So um, it certainly is a very, uh, I think that everyone that's working on the nitrogen problem has climate change as a framing sort of consequence as well as the recognition that if we continue to degrade soils, our systems are gonna be even more susceptible to the irregular rainfall that is happening. And it's, you know, farmers are talking about the climate uh, changes that they're dealing with now, 
10 years ago when I took my class out to visit farms, you never heard them mention anything about it. And now it's practically every farm we go to, they bring it up because in our area, um, the distribution of rainfall has really been just incredibly erratic for the past few years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Has it been, this is a question maybe for Lori or Sonia, has it been studied how much of a problem nitrogen pollution or contamination is for organic agriculture? Or do the principles of organic production to maintain or improve soil and water quality mean that nitrogen has, is not really an issue in organic systems? I could speak to that if you want me to. Take a crack at it. Well, maybe we go, <laughs> so, go ahead. And you first, can add, yeah. yeah. So, um, really, you know, organic agriculture is not immune to nitrogen loss. In some areas, organic agriculture is seriously putting on way too much nitrogen and contributing to you know nitrogen pollution either out the bottom or out the top. So, you know, so it's it's more about that you know if you're managing a system organically, then you don't have the bare fallow. So that's a big. Um, point where you lose nitrogen is when you have air fallows. And they're, they're supposed to be restricted and limited in organic systems, although not or, all organic farmers follow that rule. Um, uh, the quantity going on, if you put too much nitrogen into any system, then you will push loss, the losses. And the timing might be different, so if you're adding on way too much nitrogen as manure or compost, you might not lose so much immediately as if you put on, you know, 300 pounds of nitrogen fertilizer, but eventually your system will be losing lots of nitrogen. So it might stay in the soil longer, but you'll saturate the, you know, the system and its ability to retain it. On the plus side, besides the elimination of the bare fallows, when you're managing carbon with nitrogen, you know, that, that increases the internal cycling and increases certain um, pathways that can retain, help to retain nitrogen. So the, I guess I'd say the bottom line is that um, an ecologically based approach to managing nitrogen, which is, you know, very much part of organic agriculture and not all the time, has the potential to reduce losses greatly partly because you don't have to keep adding so much. So, you know, the overall, like our production of reactive in could go down if we switch, if we introduce more legumes into the systems and reduce taper wash. Our total reactive in that we need for agriculture could go down and that would have those consequences. I, I thought your presentation was very, very good in explaining just the biology of crop plants mm -hmm. and the fact that, that you put on the, all this nitrogen, just depending upon the time, they're just not able to necessarily to make use of it. And so what the farmers are doing is not necessarily irrational, it's just that they are just trying to get as much nitrogen into the system. It's, and, the, way, yeah. the, it's the way fertilizer systems are, are designed yeah. to, to yeah. have to operate. With, I mean, with existing crops, which yes. could be different with perennial crops. or with, Right, perennials yeah. Could, yeah, yeah. could be a game changer. Yeah. And Sonia, do you want to? Yeah, I thought that was a really great answer. Um, I do think, yeah, we address it briefly in our nitrogen assessment, um, and like Laurie said, it, just because something is certified organic doesn't mean there aren't nitrogen losses. You definitely can't assume that, but there's certainly that potential there. Um, and it, it's, it is tricky because it's kind of going the other way. In irrigated agriculture, which is mostly what we have in California, there is the potential, theoretically, to do this very close precision management mm -hmm. because you're adding nitrogen through the irrigation. You can add it throughout the season very easily now. So just feeding the crops exactly when they need it. And, and that does, it's been shown to have uh, a lot of impact on overall nitrogen use efficiency. In organic, it's harder to actually do that kind of precision. But on the other hand, if you build up your system so that the microorganisms are there capturing all of that, then like Lori's slide really showed really well, maybe you don't need that precision. So it's kind of two different ways to go on this, very different avenues to take. Can I have yes. one thing on yeah, the sure. yeah. So um, the Nitrogen Footprint Group has been looking at this question as well in terms of organic versus um, conventional food and whether that makes a difference in terms of your nitrogen footprint. And, the, I think the basic answer is that there isn't that much of a difference. There is a reduction in the total amount of new nitrogen that's fixed out of the atmosphere because you're not including fertilizer nitrogen. Um, but the bigger impacts are diet choices, less red meat consumption makes a, makes a large difference in your nitrogen footprint. And also um, pasture versus grass, appear, that's another factor they're trying to incorporate into the footprint. That appears to be something 
I'm sorry, pasture, grass versus grain fed meat is another factor that seems to be making a difference in the, the footprint, reducing your nitrogen. There was one final question back here. Yeah, it's an objection to Bill, but anyone else can answer. I feel like the lawsuit you're doing is an attempt to make the polluters pay and internalize the costs that you're facing. That's been externalized. I also imagine that a lawsuit pisses off a lot of people and is it a long-term <laughs> way of getting everyone across the country who's facing the same issue to do this. So I'm wondering, long-term, what do you think the policy solution is to either reduce the amount of nitrogen running off or make the polluters pay for it? Uh, first of all, you couldn't be more correct in pissing people off. Uh, our entire congressional delegation, uh, including our two U.S. Senators, our uh, U.S. House representatives, have essentially said, I'm a member of Al-Qaeda. Um, and, you know, call the city that I represent uh, New Russia. Um, and, and realistically tried to line out this urban versus rural uh, kind of dichotomy, which is, of course, ridiculous. I grew up in rural Iowa, and I used to know less water in, in uh, rural Iowa than I do in urban Iowa. Um, so there's this kind of line drawing uh, issue going on. Ultimately, all things are economic to me too, is this uh, consortium that we're part of, all of us are a part of here, really points to that the complex issues are identifying the costs, uh, identifying the benefits, and dealing with an issue that we've talked a little bit about, but subsidization. We have such a horribly distorted system from USDA that uh, how you reset that uh, so that we are not um, incenting horrible behavior, more production, more use of nitrogen will be a real challenge. I'm not sure that we can do that very easily. Making the polluter pay is certainly part of it. Um, but we're back to imperfect information and the inability of a lot of decisions to be made in this very complex arena um, with the kind of precision that we would want. Ultimately, for us, the issue becomes, frankly, I don't care whether using more legumes or using stabilizers on nitrogen are the answer to reducing the discharge of nitrate out of a pipe in the waters of the state. I don't care, so long as it's less than 10 milligrams per liter, parts per million as a water producer, that's what I care about. So let people make their individual decisions, but it has to be regulated. And right now, industrial agriculture, for the most part, unless you're fortunate enough to live in a state like California, or a state like Wisconsin, or Minnesota, that has a more progressive uh, ethic in terms of environmentalism, um, we're stuck in my world with being a material contributor to Gulf Coast hypoxia because it's the Wild West. Uh, I can do whatever I want, and there may be some economic constraints, but in a world that subsidizes nitrate production to make it cheaper, the whole subsidy cycle continues to create economic justice issues where the producers are pushing costs to consumers, and I represent consumers, 90% of whom have subsidized uh, meals in public schools. My family that engages in agriculture uh, sits on tens of millions of dollars of assets. So it's a extraordinary system that has come to us historically. It's completely topsy-turvy in terms of economics and increasingly as the science gets better, demonstrating that the scientific outcomes, the environmental adversities, are far worse than we ever imagined. So we need some system disruptors. Yeah, like lawsuits. Well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. Well, thank. I think we wrap this up now. Thank you all very much. I think we had a good. good, 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 good.